Hey everyone, how are you doing this evening? So my two colleagues and I, Mulshri and Purvaja, are going to talk to you a little bit about sexual reductive health and rights and the complexities surrounding the field. So without further ado, a little salt and pepper. This is more for me to like shake the nerves out than it is for you guys. <laughs> But welcome to our talk, Sex, Science, and the State. As you guys probably know, sexual reductive health and rights affects our everyday lives. We talk about it all the time. Even your conversations when you're on Instagram and you're checking out that new couple and you're like, what are they doing? Should they be doing that? Who lets them do that? Are they married? Does the government have a say in what they're doing? That's all part of sexual reductive health and rights. And we seek to answer those questions, as well as create an environment where we can address these issues and provide services that help people achieve their sexual reductive health and right needs. So before we move forward, we're going to do a couple of definitions of breaking down sexual reductive health and rights, or SRHR, so you guys can have an idea of the four interrelated fields that came together to form this. So first we have sexual health, the state of physical, mental, and social well-being in relation to sexuality. We have reproductive health, where people are able to have a responsible, satisfying, and safer sex life, and they can choose to have children if, when, and however, they, however they'd like to. We have sexual rights, the application of existing human rights to sexuality and sexual health. And reproductive rights, the recognition of the basic rights of all couples and individuals to make an informed decision about having children and the ability to obtain the highest quality SRH without discrimination, coercion, and violence. So as you can imagine, with such a broad scope, SRHR has had many influences that have come to make it what it is today. Starting from scientific and medical advancements such as the ultrasound, social cultural context, and yes, Lil John is the voice of our, of our population. <laughs> Economic and political influence, we all know that where the money goes is where the research goes and what gets funded. Different movements, the feminist movement, liberation and civil rights movements around the world, and the gay rights movement. So as you can imagine, it's such a vast field, it was a little difficult to break it down into approximately a one hour talk. So what we ended up deciding to do was breaking it up into three different sections and using different cases to highlight how science, political influence, social norms influence the development of SRHR policies around the world. So first we'll look at population control, eugenics, and sterilization and determine how the social norms of the time created these population control policies that resulted in the sterilization of thousands of women. We'll have a five-minute intermission, and then Purvaja will take it away and consider the claim that science and politics do not exist in separate worlds by digging deeper into the contraceptive revolution of the mid-1900s. Then we'll have a 20-minute break so you guys can stretch your legs, and then we'll have Mulshri who will take it away by interrogating, the, the interrogating the, how scientific claims when influenced by ideology can affect abortion access around the world by looking at abortion policies and the implementation of the global gag rule. The main takeaways we have of this talk are the interrelated roles of science, medicine, policy, politics, economics, and their influence on SRHR policies and individuals' sexual and productive health desires and wants around the world. So without further ado, let's hop into population control and sterilization. So prior to SRHR as it was today, it was housed within the framework of population control. And this makes sense, as governments realized individuals' sexual and productive health had a big influence in how the population's health, economic, and social well-being played out. So this resulted in many governments implementing policies um, such as the sterilization policy to control persons' um, reproductive rights and productive health under the guise of benefiting the, uh, the population through economic gain and through social gain. Before we go any further, though, let's define population control. So population control is the practice of controlling the rate of growth of a human population. 
It's usually enforced by governments. To address, to address issues of food supply, environmental concerns, poverty, and overpopulation. All through the means of reproductive and health programs that uh, give out contraceptive, uh, contraceptive services and sterilization services, amongst other methods of controlling persons' fertilities. So overall, population control doesn't sound terrible. It sounds objective and pragmatic, a way to keep the population uh, the number of the population numbers down and help preserve the Earth's natural resources and allow the country to best support its population. However, we have to interrogate why these policies were put into place, who these policies were targeted at, and how they were implemented before we can make a decision on whether this was a good policy or not. So over here we have indigenous Australians. We have the Herar women in Namibia. We have the Jewish population during the Holocaust. These are just three examples of where population control policies were put in place, including in the United States, black women in the South, Latina women in the West, and all over the world throughout the imperial, imperial empires. A lot of these population control policies were targeted towards oppressed groups around the world, which makes you question, how were these policies being put in place, and what was their purpose if they were only targeting this specific group? So how are these policies put into place? First, we have reversible methods, usually through the use of contraceptives. We have IUD, diaphragm, birth control, uh, birth control pills, and condoms, which are reversible, and when ideally implemented, would allow individuals to have information about these contraceptive methods so they could use them as they needed for their own sexual and reductive health and needs. And secondly, we had more permanent methods. And these were usually surgical methods. For women, usually tubal ligations or hysterectomies, and for men, vasectomies. These are more permanent methods of achieving these population control goals. Why were they, why were they made popular? So a lot of arguments talked about the cost effectiveness, because once you sterilize one person, you don't need to worry about their future lineage. It was permanent, has a 99.6% success rate, it also allowed the government to take control of individual sexual reductive health and rights. So they didn't need to rely on individuals to make the decision to remember to take their birth control pills or any of these other, um, any of these other methods. So all of this may sound really great and you're like, wow, what's the issue of population control? Well, let's look at some of the private motives. Sounds a little suspect when you think about the greater population, economic goals, and financial goals of Western countries during this time. But before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about sterilization and tell you what it is. And maybe also continue watching the documentary. <laughs> <laughs> so what we have is, first we have forced sterilization. The main aspect of forced sterilization is the lack of consent. So this would be people who were forced into these situations either through lack of knowledge, so they were unaware they were going to be sterilized, or even if they completely objected to being sterilized, were, went, underwent the process anyway. So they'd go through the procedure, and the result would be no more babies. The second form of sterilization was coerced sterilization. And this used financial and other incentives, misinformation, and intimidation tactics to compel individuals to get sterilized. So it gave the illusion of consent, because while people would sign these consent forms, they would do so under duress. Same process as before. Result, no more babies. So how did these policies come into place? Well, we have two main influences during this time period the late 1800s to the early 1900s. The first being the eugenics movement started by Galton in the late 1700s, who looked at negative eugenics for people who were considered inferior stock. So this, was the, this came about with the use of birth control measures and permanent, uh, permanent sterilization measures to ensure that people of inferior stock would no longer procreate and we would eliminate those gene pools in society. 
we also had positive eugenics. So this was the betterment of the population. So if you were identified as someone with superior intellectual and physical skills, or someone who, is, who would be the top, the ideal human in society, we encouraged you to procreate. So eugenics focused on the quality of people and wanting a better quality of the human population. Second, we had the Malthusian principle. We'll talk a little bit more about um, Malthus's um, theory of population growth, but his methods were just rely on positive natural checks. So natural disasters would happen, plagues would happen, and just wipe out populations and keep the population numbers down. So his main concern was the quantity of people. Second would be preventive checks. So his big idea was telling the poor people, relax, chill, you don't need more babies, so just practice abstinence, be celibate, or if people, or there had to be some intervention through sterilization or more modernly through birth control measures. So we're going to focus on the Malthusian principle and its effects on sterilization policies during this time period. So Malthus had this fear that the human population would grow and grow and grow, and the Earth would be unable to replenish its natural resources to keep up with the growth of human population. And once this happened, also known as the Malthusian catastrophe, we would expect there to be no more people, or people would die out at this point in time. So his big idea was we need to control the quantity of people um, so that we don't reach this Malthusian catastrophe. This is a big argument that's been used in uh, favor of population control policies, not just at that time, but continues to do so through neo-Malthusian principles. Second, we're going to talk about eugenics. And we'll be focusing the rest of this section of the talk on the influence of eugenics on population control policies during this time. So as we mentioned, if you were considered someone who has superior stock in the human population and would supply superior genealogy to the human race, we would the youth, people who follow the eugenics principles would encourage your breeding and encourage you to marry and have more children. So that was our positive eugenics. If you were part of the population that they considered inferior, so these were people who were considered feeble-minded, um, physically disabled, and more likely to be a burden in society, we would want to control your fertility and ensure that you did not procreate and, con and contribute these genes to the greater human population. So how did eugenics become justified and become such a mainstream idea during this point of time, influencing population control policies all around the world? Well, science, and that was Science italicized. Um, because a lot of the sciences that were used at this point in time have been greatly disproven, but at that point in time were widely accepted by populations. So first we have phrenology. So a lot of you may have an idea of it. It's the study of skull size and brain volume to determine how the, pretty much the superiority of human races around, around the world and at this time. I should give a little sidebar that science at this point in time was greatly influenced by ideas of racism and eugenics. So you'll see a lot of principles where the ideal was the Apollo Belvedere, white, European, and the further down you went in the phrenology scale, the more likely you were to be non-white. People who were further down on the phrenology scale were considered to be inferior persons and not considered to be physically fit. And we did not want those people to be contributing to the gene pool. So when you look at population control policies, they were targeted at usually non-white populations within the United States and outside and all over the world. Another major player was Binet's IQ test. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with the IQ test. You might want to take a look at these numbers, see where you fall. If you scored below a 291, you'd be considered an imbecile. Below a 180, a moron. Below a 124, an idiot. Pretty much, if you were within those three umbrellas, you were considered feeble-minded. We do not want feeble-minded people in our societies, according to eugenics. And you would be amongst a population of people that would have population control policies targeted at you. We have a fourth little category here, or not so little, with physically defective. 
So if you were considered to be physically defective, you would also be someone who would be in a population where population control policies, usually sterilization, would be targeted towards you. And these were the sciences of the day. And you can imagine, with science being something that people look at objectively and trust, this is what people were using to justify eugenics. Thankfully, a lot of these sciences have been debunked. And what were the sociopolitical influences of eugenics? At the time, we have to consider the great, a huge influx of immigration during that time. In the late 1800s, there were about 100,000 people coming into the United States. Towards the early to mid 1900s, this increased up to millions of people. There was a big fear that non-white populations in the United States would outnumber the white population. And how did this play itself out? For people coming into the country, regressive immigration policies, such as the Chinese Exclusion Act, were put into place. And within the country, sterilization policies were put into place. And as some of you may know, this resulted in the mass sterilization of thousands of women in the South in California, usually women of color. More globally, we have imperialism. So the fears tended to mirror those of immigration, um, usually, but in this case, it was on a much, much larger scale. And the fear was the population of non-white countries was going to outpace those of white countries. And I quote, the fear was the poor, overcrowded, dirty Africans would become reliant on the West for interventions to help them reach their economic and social goals. And this would put a strain on their economies. And that's what justified the sterilization policies around the world outside of the United States. So while you think about this, we're going to look at a little video about a case of forced sterilization in California. Thousands of Latino women during this time period were sterilized through state sanctioned sterilization. A lot of, in this particular case, Madrigal versus Killigan, they didn't win their lawsuit. And a lot of policies that enforce forced sterilization still go on today. So I'd like you to think about the scientific justifications, the social political justifications of population control policies, specifically sterilization policies, on these women and how it played out. The idea that some, someone could be forcibly sterilized seemed like something out of a mental institution out of the 1920s. This was happening until the 1970s and still goes on today. It took many other cases, Buck v. Bell and, others, and other cases, for a specific aspects of sterilization policies to get, uh, to get overturned. However, there are still policies today 
that allow for forced sterilization under specific circumstances. Why was sterilization so widely spread and why does it still continue today? We have to think about these questions as we move forward in the, SRH, in the field of SRHR. As we do so, I'd like you to think about that as we talk about a case that happened in 2017. So Janina was a woman who lived in a small town in Sao Paulo. She's the mother of five children, homeless, poor, and has a history of substance use. In October 2017, a judge in Makoka ordered that Ms. Janina be compulsorily sterilized. The reasons they gave were her lifestyle could lead to irresponsible and unplanned growth of her offspring. And because of her condition, she does not demonstrate any discernment to evaluate the consequences of gestation and therefore should be sterilized even <coughs> if against her will. In February 2018, after giving birth to her child, Ms. Carina was sterilized without her consent. During this entire process, Ms. Carina was not consulted by her physicians, her lawyers, or the judge who ended up making this decision. And the only condition she did have was she did have a history of substance use. So when we think of these policies, we need to look at how the phenomenon of forced sterilization showcased the ties between social norms, uh, application of medical and scientific advancement in the development of these state policies. At this point in time, these social norms were primarily eugenics related. And we have to look at how these social norms and how these implementation of these policies have continued to have far lasting effects on these individuals. While hindsight allows us to see and develop and critique these historic occurrences, we must be forced to think of women like Janaina, who are still being forcibly sterilized, and usually under the guise of betterment for the society or betterment for themselves, but these decisions are usually tinged with the history of racism, eugenics, and a bit of neo malthusian theory. We must remember that for the field to keep advancing in a manner that elevates the individual and societies, we have to keep these forces in balance. Policy development, scientific advancement, human rights and ethics, and the steadfast guardianship of these human rights and ethics. If we're not aware of these things and continue to allow the population to supersede the rights of the individual, we'll end up with situations like that happened in the early 1900s with thousands of women being forcibly sterilized against their will. So in summary, we looked a little bit at population control as a precursor to SRHR. The strong influences that eugenics and other social norms had on the application of population control theories and how that resulted in the sterilization of thousands of women at that point in time. Overall, we have to be aware that while this may, happen, this may have happened in a specific time period, it is still impossible for us to extricate the role of science and medicine in the development of social and political theories and policies. And vice versa, we have to consider the influence of social and political policies on the development and the enactment of science and medical procedures. While you guys think about this and look at how science, the development of science and application of science influences politics and vice versa, how we can continue to uphold the human rights of the individual by leveraging all of these fields. Thank you. So we do have a five minute Q&A and I realized I was not using the mic at all because I'm a mover. But um, if you have any questions, Please feel free. <coughs> Sorry. Yes. Oh, no questions. Yes. <laughs> um, what are the numbers? Like, is there are there any instances of male forced sterilization? 
Yes, there are. And actually, in the second part of our talk, um, Purvija will talk a little bit about forced sterilization of men in the Indian context. Um, so she'll go a little bit more into that, and you'll get a little bit more yeah, answer about that. And so the question was, are there any instances of forced male sterilization? Correct? Okay. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Um. Can you give a little more context on the Brazil case? And why was there a case brought? Who brought it? Um, why did the woman not know anything about it? Was it done while she was at the hospital? Like, what exactly did that look like? So um, but there isn't a lot of information on the Brazil case as of now, but what we do know about the context is that she's someone who was on government assistance, and during those visits that she'd have um, either to get food and all of that, they realized that she had five kids and she was pregnant with the sixth kid. And during this time period, I'm not sure who reported her or who took her, who took her to court, but we assume that it was related to her substance use and once she was being held, one of, the, one of the conditions that she was given was either to go through this um, procedure or she'd have her children taken away from her. But during this time, while they did give her this quote unquote choice, as we talked about that's coercive, um, she was not consulted as to whether what sterilization was, whether she wanted to go through with it, or what other options there may be um, right now. We know that she's gone through the sterilization, but we haven't heard anything more from that situation. I assume it's an ongoing case. Um, there have been a lot of human rights activists who are going down there to try and figure out what they can do about it. But once you've gone through sterilization, it's really hard to reverse. And we assume it's just going to be another case that was similar to what happened in the early 1900s, where there may be some sort of larger social political change with regards to policies and who has um, say over women's bodily autonomy, but for Janaina, for her personal well-being, that doesn't really make a difference. If she chooses to have more kids, she's unable to do so. Yes. Is it more general of consent for medical procedures? Mm -hmm. When did that become an established sort of thing that we yeah. you know, feel excited about? Like, we need to know. Actually, so. <laughs> Not yeah. Yeah, no, actually, the Madrigal one of, so while the Madrigal Killigan case, um, they didn't win their lawsuit, that was one of the things that did come out of that case, was the, there had to be informed consent, and what that meant was consent forms had to be printed out in multiple languages, you had to make sure that the person did understand what you were telling them as well. So this is probably, the case was carried out in the late 1960s, so I assume that's about the same time that consent actually became a policy in place in the medical field. Yes? Okay. So do you have, do you want to go into this a little bit? Yeah, she talks about it a lot. So like a lot of the questions we assume are going to be answered as we go forward. Yeah. Stay tuned. Any further questions? Okay. Great. Well, we'll introduce Purvija. both on? Okay, cool. Hi, everyone. Um, so other than, everyone can hear me, yes? Great. Um, so other than sterilization, birth control technologies, formerly known as contraceptives, are a major tool used in the world of SRHR, sexual reproductive health policy making. Now, before I delve into my specific case studies of contraceptives, what is a contraceptive device? A contraceptive device is an artificial device that serves to stop pregnancy as a result of sexual intercourse. It can take the form of a physical barrier, such as condoms or diaphragms, 
or they can directly regulate the body's sex hormones, um, and methods include taking pills, having an IUD, having, having an implant. They can also take the form of injectables. And that brings us to our case study of Depo Provera. Available in the market in 1963, Depo Provera is an injectable contraceptive that contains the hormone progestin. It's administered by either a doctor or a nurse, and it stops pregnancy, more or less. The benefits of a single shot of Depo Provera is that one shot, it can stop pregnancy between three to six months. The benefits of this is that a woman is essentially free from this daily need to take birth control. Additionally, this birth control method can be used privately. And this is beneficial if a woman's partner is hostile or prohibits the use of contraceptives. So, Deepa Provera allows a woman to control her reproduction and her body both privately and safely. That being said, this gain in control is also associated with the loss of control. The downside of Deepa Provera is that should a woman feel a painful side effect, which includes cramping, or uncontrollable menstrual bleeding, she has to endure this pain until the injection wears off. So three to six months. So with Deepa Provera, we can clearly see there are pros and there are also cons. Deepa Provera, when offered as one of many options with appropriate counseling and screening, can be a very powerful tool in SRHR that helps women combat their powerlessness and male opposition to contraceptives. Indian feminist Dr. Hari Jan notes that she found Deepa Provera to be very effective medically and socially when individually administered to her and her patients in rural South India. Um, accordingly, many international organizations such as the UNFPA and the International Planned Parenthood Federation have used Deepa Provera in the international aid come population policy uh, programs. However, Deepa Provera has a dark side. It has a history that is riddled with controversies when it is used as part of large scale population control programs. For example, in Thailand, in refugee camps, the International Committee of the Red Cross found that Cambodian brides were forced to have this injection in order to be allowed to be married. Or in South Africa, where agencies were administering Deepa Provera without the consent of young black women. Additionally, in this time period in South Africa, um, black women, in order to get a job, have to, had to present to their employers doctor-certified family planning cards in order to get a job. So how exactly did this scientific, technological, contraceptive invention lead to these three very different situations? Well, just like with Nambi section, we need to situate this reproductive advancement in the history, in the institutions, and in the politics. So without further ado, welcome to the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, also known in the SRHR world as a contraceptive revolution. <laughs> so, in addition to Deepa Provera, this time period saw the mass creation of a number of contraceptive devices, specifically hormonal contraceptives. As we travel along this timeline, um, you can see this very boom in all these devices. This is a particularly hideous and ugly slide, so I, with my autistic abilities, made this. Um, each pink dot represents um, a reproductive hormonal contraceptive technology that came about. It's not an exhaustive dot list. Um, you'll also note that one of the pink dots is blue, um, and that is our dear friend Deepo Provera. So a lot of these developments, it should be noted, happened in the Western world. Um, and you can see it's kind of a bit of a boom. But this boom is considered even louder and more prominent if we consider the time period before the boom, the pre-contraceptive revolution, which happened between the early 1900s to the mid 20th century. 
So in medical spaces in this era, the discussions around contraceptives, if they were happening at all, um, were often conducted in the back alleyways between patients and physicians in hushed whispers. And pharmaceutical companies, well, they completely shied away from this area as it was not financially, financially lucrative. Within political spaces, governments were not involved with respect to discussion or funding. The fight for contraceptives and control over women's reproductive lives was primarily a fight and struggle within grassroots movements. And if you know what this is, it's a radical feminist movement. <laughs> so as we can see from both the political and medical spaces, the fight for contraceptive access was happening on the fringes of society and not in the mainstream eye. So I've been talking at you for quite a fair bit now. It seems appropriate to have a little bit of a question time where I ask a question to you. Um, so there's a period of relative silence around birth control research and development. Who do you think ignited the contraceptive revolution? Raise your hand if you think it was the radical feminist movement. Great. Uh, raise your hand now if you think it was government and big pharmaceutical companies. Okay, great, you've been paying attention. Good, good. <laughs> so yeah, if you guess government and big pharma, you are absolutely correct. What was formerly the primary struggle of the radical feminist movement now became an urgent state interest. Mainstream governments, in particular the US, had a need for contraceptives. And so contraceptives, they move from the hush whispers occurring in the back alleyways into the mouths and language of the government. The effect of this was the legitimizing of the need for contraceptives. And this in turn sparked the massive explosion in the research and developments in these birth control technologies that we saw in the timeline slides a couple of slides ago. I'm gonna drink some water. Sorry if you hear that. Um, <laughs> Oh. Sorry. Um, so what motivated the government's interest in contraceptives during this period of time? To understand this, we need to understand the socio-political context. The contraceptive revolution began in a post-World War II landscape. The Western world had just won the war and they needed to, and really wanted to really, maintain this power. But there were two obstacles in the West's road to continued superiority. One, national, natural resource depletion. An industrialized US needed minerals and fuel reserves to continue operating as is. However, they also needed it as a strategic tool. The Soviet Union, which was a major wartime foe of the US and the Western world, had vast areas of minerals and fuels so in order to maintain competitiveness, the US and the Western world too needed these minerals, fuel, and resources. And often Western governments, they look towards the lands of former colonies. The second issue is national security concerns. Nas national, not natural. Um, cool. Um, so many European countries they saw the growing populations of their former colonies as detrimental to one, effective colonial control, but also two, to the availability of resources in their land, as well as the purity of their home soils. Four, they saw the growing population and the overpopulation of these underdeveloped nations. They saw that, and they had this fear, that people there would emigrate into their countries. So, Governments needed a way to address these two roadblocks. They needed a way to marry the two state goals in order to maintain power. How did they go about doing this? Well, let's turn to post-World War II North America and roll in, not that, roll in the population bomb. The population bomb was an idea brought about by the works of three men, Hugh Everett, Fairfield Osborne, and William Vaux and this later on inspired Paul Ehrlich's book of the very same name. It was an idea of the population bomb that contextualized and formalized these government fears, set a policy agenda, 
and then this led to the explosion in the research and development of contraceptive technologies. So I keep talking about the population bomb. What is it? And how does it tick? What makes it work? The mechanics. The population bomb is the idea that population growth is unsustainable. And the fundamental logic behind this comes from our dear friend, maybe not our friend, but he's definitely an economist and demographer that Nambly um, talked about, Thomas Malthus. So he fundamentally believed that populations and resources grow in different ways. I'm not going to use Nambi's uh, Pac-Man examples because I prefer food and donuts. So he believed that populations grow rapidly and increasingly faster than resources, which you can see by this little animation. Another way to see this, and my preferred way as a public health student, is a diagram. So if you look at the diagram above, the population bomb gets set off when resource growth, uh, rather population growth exceeds resource growth. And thus, the population bomb marries the two ideas, the two state fears. One, the availability and access to minerals and fuel reserves in developing countries. And two, the national security concerns of the overpopulation of these underdeveloped countries. And so now, with the population bomb, governments have a concrete problem they need to address. They need to stop this very ticking bomb. And the US government, well, they needed a way to do this, and they needed a way to do this very fast. So in the field of population control and demography population studies, there are two ways to reduce the size of a population, not accounting for migration. One, increase mortality, i.e. kill people. <laughs> two, is to prevent births, reduce fertility. Given that the first option is kind of unethical, governments turn to the next option, the lower hanging fruit on this tree of ethics, um, <laughs> which is controlling women's fertility. And what other way to control women's fertility than through contraceptive devices? So through government fears over maintaining power, being formalized by the population bomb, this led to the field and the need for population control, and this in turn led to the popular, oh, rather the contraceptive revolution. So, the contraceptive revolution proliferated in a number of ways. Firstly, it led to the opening and funding of many government research institutes, private agencies, and consultancy groups, all dedicated to the combating and controlling of overpopulation in these underdeveloped countries. So a few more, um, and then a list. Um, and secondly, the US government also started investing a lot of money into this field. And that made it financially lucrative for big pharmaceutical companies to get involved. So it became even further profitable for big pharma to get involved, i.e. to branch out to these underdeveloped nations because the markets in those nations aren't as heavily regulated as the markets here with the FDA. So, and now, with a mix of government fears, the population bomb, formal research institutes, and the fundamental and very special ingredient of funding, the contraceptive revolution, with its mass creation of, of hormonal contraceptives, was born. This technological advancement in sexual reproductive science was largely driven by government's needs to maintain power, using women's reproductive lives and fertility as a means to achieve population control and therefore resource power. So what are the side effects of the contraceptive revolution not being based in women's rights? What are the side effects of the contraceptive revolution not being based in human rights, in bodily autonomy, in health systems reform? What are the side effects of the contraceptive revolution rather being based on the need and the maintenance of international geopolitical power differentials? What are the side effects of the population control movement being based in the ascertainment of economic and strategic development. 
the side effects of this, the health of the people in these underdeveloped nations is placed in jeopardy. The side effects of this, a mass scale human rights violations. <laughs> and thus, we return back to our case study of Deepa Provera in both Thailand and South Africa. The coercive administration to young Cambodian brides in refugee camps was an attempt to prevent this foreign population from growing. The administration of Deepa Provera without the consent of young black women in South Africa was a racist attempt by the government to prevent the black population from growing under the guise of population control, economic security. And it should be noted that these human rights violations extend well beyond the realm of Deepa Provera. In India in the 1970s, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi saw that the birth rate was not decreasing. It was very stubborn. It just wouldn't go down. And so she called for a state of emergency. And in the state of emergency, she called for the forced sterilization of poor men in rural villages. However, not all is quite so bleak in this birth control pocket of SRHR. Contraceptives can and have been administered to people in underdeveloped nations in ways that help people control their reproductive lives and bolster self-empowerment. Let's return again back to our case study of Deepa Provera in rural South India, where Dr. Hari John notes that Deepa Provera, for both her and her patients, was empowering and the availability of it was empowering. The difference with this case in South India and the other cases is that, and this compared to the other cases, is that the women here were seen as holes and not as means to an end. And this emphasis on human rights and indignity began to ripple into the population community's language and discussions post-contraceptive revolution. The 1970s saw the mass proliferation in social movements such as the women's movement, gay rights movements, and several labor and civil rights movements. This led to the powerful reframing of population control policies towards ones based in dignity, human rights, and not solely based in power. And this led the field of population control to our new field of sexual, reproductive health and rights. In conclusion, just like with NAMBI section, we see that science and politics do not exist in separate worlds. The trajectory, trajectory of science and what gets developed in science is motivated and influenced by the politics of the time. With NAMBI section, we saw that with the sterilization projects being motivated by eugenics and blatant racism, really. And with my section, we see that the contraceptive revolution was motivated by governmental agendas and the availability of funding. All that being said, politics doesn't necessarily lead science down a bad path. We saw that with the 1970s social movements leading SRHR to a more human rights-based one. All in all, whether politics leads science down a good or a bad path, it is undeniable that the political realities in many ways shape the path of scientific endeavors. And so with that, we conclude the first half of um, our lecture. There will be a 20 minute intermission, as you can read up here. And then after that, um, Malshri will be talking about abortion and the global gag rule. And then after that, we'll be having an interactive demonstra demonstration, demo for short, um, <laughs> where we will, three of us will be showing different things from our field. I'll be showing stuff on how to communicate abortion to different audiences. Nambi and Malshri will be showing other stuff as well. <laughs> that will be interesting. Um, stay tuned, you have to stay here to find out. So yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, welcome back everyone. Hope you enjoyed the break. Um, so Nambi and Purvaja have so far talked about some very important issues in the field of SRHR. Nambi talked about race-based science, eugenics, and how that informed and continues to inform forced sterilization policies all over the world. And uh, Purvaja talked about how uh, contraceptive developments in science um, align with the national security interests 
to disenfranchise marginalized people all over the world. And, uh, but so far we haven't touched on what is perhaps the most contentious, the most hot button issue in SRHR debate, at least in the United States. Abortion, the A word. And that's what I'm going to be talking about. I'll be talking to you about abortion and a little US policy known as the global gag rule. <clears throat> so let's begin. So what is abortion? The deliberate termination of a human pregnancy, most often performed during the first 28 weeks of pregnancy, is how the OED defines it. I'm going to be using this little icon to refer to it. <clears throat> and uh, the abortion debate in the US, as I mentioned, is very tense, very controversial, and uh, the framing question surrounding this debate really is, when does life begin? And to rephrase it a little more specifically, the question, what it really means is, when does a fetus, um, and you'll find the definition of fetus on your handout, uh, become an individual with rights? So there are two main camps in this debate. The first one is the anti-choice camp. The anti-choice camp argues that the fetus from the moment it is conceived is an individual with human rights, including the right to life. That means that an abortion is equivalent to taking away uh, an individual's human right to life and is therefore profoundly unethical. The second camp which opposes the anti-choice camp is the pro-choice camp. They have a more difficult time answering this question. What they say is that uh, the question of when a fetus becomes an individual with rights is complicated, it can't be easily answered, but their counter argument usually is that we cannot deny that the pregnant person who uh, is carrying the fetus is an individual with inalienable rights. <clears throat> so what that means is that when you curtail someone's access to an abortion, you are taking away their fundamental reproductive right, which is a concept that Nambi and Purvija covered before me. So these are the two main camps, but let's go back to the question for a second. When does life begin? When does a fetus become an individual with rights? Is this a scientific question? What do you think? Who, who said no? I can't hear you. No. <laughs> okay, why not? I would say no because if it was, it would be technically, I mean, if it was purely scientific, I would think that it's when the fetus is viable so it can survive with outside of the mother's womb on its own. Mm. So people who are anti choice would not agree with that. So. Yeah, that's a great point. So. I think what you're getting at is um, that life, the concept of life, cannot be solely defined biologically. So in part, it is a scientific question. It looks like a scientific question on the surface of it because you're using the word fetus. But it's also a political question because you're also using words like life and individual and human rights, all of which are political concepts. You have to do a deep dive into political philosophy to answer this question. And however you answer this question will be informed by your own political views. That is what makes abortion a really interesting case study for this uh, talk, which is really about how science and politics interact. Um, because it's really hard to answer scientific questions about abortion because it's such a political topic and therefore, because, uh, therefore all the questions that you ask about abortion are inherently political. So I've been talking so far about the abortion debate in the US, but this is a talk, talk about global health. What about abortion debates elsewhere? So take a look at this image up here. There are a lot of words. I don't want you to focus on the words. What I want you to focus on is how colorful this map is. 
And what it essentially communicates is that there is a huge variety of abortion-related laws all over the world. In different parts of the world, abortion has different levels of restriction. Um, blue, for example, means that abortion is legal on request. Red means that it is illegal in all cases, except when um, it threatens the life of the pregnant woman. So what this really tells you is that the nature of the US debate doesn't apply in all contexts. If you go to another country, you'll find an entirely different debate about abortion. So why did I spend four slides talking about the US debate? Why is it so important? Um, simply because of the level of influence it exerts. And why does it exert this level of influence? As Purvaja mentioned before me, the secret ingredient, again, is money. <laughs> the US is by far the single largest uh, donor in terms of foreign aid in the world. Foreign aid means any assistance, monetary or otherwise, given to underdeveloped countries to help with their economic, social, uh, and political development. So in 2016, the US donated $49 billion, um, donated or lent $49 billion to uh, underdeveloped countries. This is a pretty small percentage of the US budget, only about 1%. But it's a lot of money. Ta-da! <laughs> um, and that brings us to the global gag rule, which is a US policy that is pretty much all about money. What the global gag rule says is that any foreign non-governmental organization or NGO NGOs are usually the types of organizations which provide these um, services that are funded by the US government and other governments. Any foreign non-governmental organization that is uh, performing or informing patients about abortions loses all its US funding, um, even if they are using their own money for these abortion-related activities. So. Notice that they lose all their US money. This didn't used to be the case until 2017. Um, before this, they only lost money related to family planning activities. So for example, if they were advising people about abortion, they lost funding related to contraception or sterilization or um, counseling related to family planning. But now they lose all their global health funding, which is a cool $10, million, $10 billion. Um, and that's uh, very worrisome because that hugely impacts the global health landscape and the kinds of services that NGOs can provide. So who's put this rule into place? Obviously, the US government is a big player. They, I mean, it's their policy. Um, and uh, you can see from this timeline that it has a very storied history. It was first implemented in 1984, uh, rescinded in 1993, put back in place in 2001, rescinded again in 2009, and finally in 2017, it's been reinstated and expanded to apply to all global health funding. So, it's pretty much a political uh, volleyball. And, uh, but the US government is not the only player, of course. What has been the force that has brought this issue to the US government's attention at all? Or um, has brought it to the international stage? That brings us back, unsurprisingly enough, to the anti-choice lobby. And um, we're going to be talking a little bit more about the arguments that the anti-choice lobby uses to promote policies like the global gag rule, which curtail access to abortion. So 
What are the reasons behind the global gag rule? What are the arguments that convince a government that this is a reasonable policy to put in place? Most of the arguments we hear against abortion relate to religion and morality and uh, the fundamental unethical nature of abortion as perceived by some groups. But more and more, uh, anti-abortion activists have been using science in their arguments. And this brings me to the crux of my section, the interaction of science and politics and how it influences SRHR policy. So I want to look into a few uh, claims put forward by the anti-choice lobby to promote policies like the global gag rule. One of the most prominent scientific claims put forward by the anti-choice lobby is the thesis of post-abortion syndrome. So what post-abortion syndrome claims is that abortion causes depression and suicide. In uh, the 1990s, uh, an American psychotherapist known as Dr. Vincent Rue put forward this claim in front of US Congress. And what he actually said was that in his patients, he had observed abortion resulting in post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. This claim rapidly mutated into an ominous suggestion of multiple mental illnesses, including depression and suicide, but not limited to those. So this claim has pretty much been around for a few decades. It's very prominent. Um, if in certain circles, you almost can't even argue against it. But that's what we're going to do today. We're going to think about the evidence underlying this claim. So what's the evidence for or against post-abortion syndrome? Is post-abortion syndrome recognized in any um, of the textbooks or handbooks used by mental health providers? Nope. Shockingly enough, it is not. Um, it's also not recognized by a variety of expert bodies, including the American Psychological Association, the American Psychiatric Association, and the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, based in the UK. <clears throat> but often medical textbooks and handbooks and experts can be behind the times. Um, science is constantly evolving. What does the most recent research say? Um, a 2009 study in the Harvard Review of Psychiatry, which uh, basically reviewed all the existing literature and articles about post-abortion syndrome, found that all of the papers that supported this thesis had methodological issues, which basically meant that abortion was, in fact, not a very good predictor of mental illness of any kind. What was, in fact, a really good predictor was pre-existing mental illness. Total shocker. Um, and pre-existing mental illness was in turn predicted by um, domestic violence and sexual abuse. So really abortion has nothing to do with it. So that's been debunked. On to the next one. Another really prominent claim is that abortion is associated with an increased risk of breast cancer. Um, what's the evidence surrounding this claim? So almost the moment it was put forward, it was explicitly rejected by the medical and scientific community. Um, but in the early 2000s, it actually resurfaced on the website of the National Cancer Institute. Um, which put forward this claim that uh, if you have an abortion, you have an increased risk of breast cancer. Um, and again, there was an immediate backlash, and the NCI itself actually had to put together a, com a committee to investigate the evidence behind this claim, and they themselves were forced to conclude that the claim was not medical or scientific, but rather political in nature. That is pretty incredible. 
So this one doesn't hold any water either. On to the last one. <clears throat> Abortion reduces fertility. This sounds pretty uh, believable. Um, and uh, indeed, in the past, when most abortions were performed surgically uh, through a surgery on the uterus, um, there was indeed a risk of scarring that could lead to fertility-related complications or um, other side effects. But today, um, if uh, you're well-versed in how abortion works, most abortions take place with the help of a little pill called mesoprostol. I think I'm pronouncing it right. And uh, that doesn't have anything to do with scarring or a loss of fertility or any other um, unpleasant side effects. So this claim is basically outdated, and, uh, but it's still being um, bandied about. So none of these theories hold any water. They don't have a lot of scientific evidence behind them when you really investigate them. But that hasn't stopped them. People still make these claims. And because science is such an incredibly powerful force in influencing people and getting things done and uh, in uh, persuading people of a certain argument, and because we as a society don't always investigate scientific claims the way we should, these have led to, um, along with other forces, policies like the global gag rule and a number of other abortion restrictions that have been put in place in the US itself. And the global gag rule has some really terrible consequences. You'd think that a policy that reduces access to abortions would perhaps reduce a demand to abortions. That's not the case. The only thing it does is it increases unsafe abortions. In the world, 42 m million women a year have an abortion, and over 50% of these abortions are unsafe. That's a pretty unacceptable statistic. And in the more restrictive areas that you saw on the map that are red and yellow and orange, uh, there's actually a higher demand for abortions, which is funny, um, but also it's not. Um, it's sad because people in more restricted areas end up having more unsafe abortions. And what's the consequence of unsafe abortions? Increased maternal mortality. <coughs> Excuse me. 13% um, of maternal deaths are due to unsafe abortions. That's a huge proportion. That's a huge number of women who could be, um, whose deaths could be averted if people simply had access to safe abortion, which they should because it's a reproductive right. And as I mentioned before, because this policy also restricts access to global health funding, <coughs> excuse me, I'm a little sick. Um, this policy also restricts access to global health funding. You have reduced access to other family planning services and also really important interventions like HIV AIDS interventions, which are often done by the same organizations that provide family planning services. And finally, these very same organizations are often at the helm of social progress in underdeveloped countries in the area of gender rights, gay rights, SRHR, and by defunding them, um, the US government essentially undoes decades of progress in these areas, which is really worrisome. And so in summary, um, the global gag rule is driven by moral and ideological and political forces. <coughs> but it's also driven very strongly by scientific arguments. And that's why it's really important for us to interrogate scientific claims. 
because we have to recognize that not only does science influence policy, which is usually a good thing, but politics and the political context we live in also influences science. And not all scientific claims are true, which seems a pretty straightforward statement when I say it, but it's hard to put it into practice. Um, and that's what all of us have really been talking about. We've been talking about how science influences politics and politics influences science and how this has real consequences for people um, who are marginalized. And so I want to leave you with not a takeaway point, but a takeaway question. When you think about science and how science influences policy, think about is politics influencing the scientific claims that you are consuming and applying to policy? Thank you. <laughs> um, and I'd like to give a shout out to our amazing lecture coordinator, Aseda, and um, also to our graphic designer. <laughs> And also to our graphic designer, who I think isn't here right now, but she made the amazing image at the beginning of her talk. Awesome. Um, so we'll be doing a little demo in which we'll be um, showing you some examples of SRHR interventions that are um, working against these uh, slightly depressing topics that we told you about um, to end on a high note. So Nambi is going to be talking about um, gender-based violence in post-conflict settings and um, Purvaja will be talking about abortion because that's her area of expertise actually. And uh, I'm going to be showing you some work on sexuality education which is what I did before coming to graduate school. So we'll be set up here. Please join us and you can rotate between the tables. Thank you.